Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Daniel Rogers, and as you know, I'm standing in for Don Preston, and he'll be back, hopefully, on Monday. Today's book I want to show you is Christian Christianity's Great Dilemma. Is Jesus Coming Again or Is He Not? by Glenn Hill. You really need to get a copy of this book. It's easy to understand, it's logical, it's easy to follow, and it makes a great tool that you can share uh, with those whom you've been discussing things concerning the time of the end. I think you'll really appreciate it, and you'll appreciate its simplicity uh, its and its ability to impart into another the knowledge um, of the Word of God in a clear, easy-to-understand fashion. Today we're going to continue our discussion on the land promises. We saw how Abraham was looking forward to the time when God would fulfill uh, his promises in the promised seed, that is, Christ. He was looking for these promises in a heavenly sense, in a better sense. You see, this is an interesting dilemma that individuals have. They all they want it to be about the land. They want Israel to return to the land. Let's go fight for, uh, let's go fight for the Jews and get them their land back. Well, that's not better. The heavenly country that Christ brings about is better. That is temporal. That is earthly. That is carnal. But see, we should be instead trying to get people into the heavenly country of Hebrews chapter 11. The country that the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 12, we've arrived. We've arrived at Mount Zion. We've arrived at the heavenly Jerusalem. And now we can have an everlasting city as opposed to the temporary city that was ready to vanish away. Uh, Hebrews 8 verse 13 as well as Hebrews 13 verse 10, I think. Uh, it's in there. You'll find it. It'll do you good to read the whole chapter anyways. But today we're going to talk about the relationship between the New Jerusalem and between the kingdom of God. We've already established the, the relationship by going to Hebrews chapter 12, but now we're going to talk more about the timing uh, of the arrival of this kingdom and the entrance into it by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's a question. Has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob entered into the kingdom of heaven. Think about Matthew 7, 21. Uh, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob entered the kingdom of heaven? Yes or no? Think about that question. In other words, are they in Hades? Right? Or have they been risen up out of that realm? You see, in Ephesians chapter 2, we learn that to sit on the throne with Christ, what do you have to do? You have to be risen with him out of, uh, out of the trespasses of sin and into life in Christ. And that's how you are risen up to sit in heavenly places. Has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob entered the kingdom of heaven? Well, Luke 13 and 23 and following tells us when they would. Then one said to Jesus, and let me actually show you this on the screen uh, for you. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know, I do not know you, uh, where you are from. Then you'll be uh, then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and yourselves thrust out. They will come from east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. In this passage, we find that the entrance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into the kingdom would be the time when these, uh, when Jesus' audience, who rejected the gospel of the kingdom, would be cast out of the presence of God. See, they were members of the old covenant, but there was coming a time when the bondwoman and her son would be cast out as you learn in Galatians chapter 4. And so Jesus sets up the time frame here for the arrival of the kingdom, for the entrance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, which means their resurrection, per, per Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 
And it also shows us, therefore, when the land promises would be fulfilled, when the heavenly country promise would be fulfilled. But that's not all in this text. Let's continue on. On that very day, some Pharisees came, came saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Why does he want to kill him? Because Jesus is talking about the kingdom. He's talking about uh, the entrance into the kingdom. And so this was a threat to the throne. See, the Pharisees had a very carnal understanding of the promises of the Old Testament. They still looked for a kingdom, but they had a carnal understanding concerning the kingdom. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform uh, cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, by the way, what had, uh, uh, what had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked for? They looked for perfection, right? And Hebrews 12 says, We've arrived at just men made perfect. Nevertheless, he says, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. Now see, the prophets passed out of the land at the fall of Jerusalem, per Zechariah 13 and verses 1 and 2. So Rome could not be the one who kills the prophets because all the prophets were already dead, or they had already the prophets had already passed out of the land. That that uh, thing that was in part had vanished away, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8 to 13. But let's continue on. He says, How often I wanted to gather your children together, as the hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Now just follow the yous in this text. He says, You yourselves are going to be cast out. Your house will be left to you desolate. So the it's the fall of Jerusalem. It's the destruction of the temple. That's the time when uh, when Jesus would say, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. He says, Many will say unto me, In that day, in what day? In the day that they would enter the kingdom of heaven. By the way, both Jesus and John said in Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4 that that kingdom was at hand, which means the time for them to be cast out. Uh, that rejected the gospel of the kingdom was at hand. And so uh, what we have here again is the coming in of the new Jerusalem is the time when the old Jerusalem is destroyed. The coming in of the heavenly country is the time when the earthly land is cast out. The coming in of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Gentiles as well, if you go back up and uh, uh, check out that context, you'll see that as well. They come from the east, from the west, from the north, the south. Their coming in is the time that the wicked Jews who rejected the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom would be cast out as well. And this is the same theme that you have in the Old Testament. In passages like Isaiah 25 and uh, Isaiah 65, it's out with the old, in with the new. Well, that's all the time I have for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, listen, I'd like to invite you to a special lectureship up in Ludington, Michigan, August the 4th through the 6th. I'm leaving today for it, uh, and I'll be speaking on Friday night at 7 p.m., and I'll be talking about the feast days, and uh, the, the whole subject matter, though, is going to be on the, uh, let's see, it's going to be on things written for our learning, Old Testament passages that shed some light on some New Testament texts, or rather, I suppose, New Testament passages that shed light on Old Testament texts. And so there's also going to be a debate between Drew Leonard and Steve Bason. Steve Bason, of course, will be defending a preterist view. Drew Leonard will be defending a futurist view of the resurrection of the just and the unjust. So with that being said, hope to see you up in Michigan. If not, hope to see your name uh, come across the comment section on the live feed, and I will talk uh, to you all when I get an opportunity at a later date. Um, Don told me yesterday on the phone that I would be getting to do morning musings shortly. Uh, we just don't know when exactly that would be. So until then, God bless. Have a great weekend. And I hope uh, that you that your light shines brighter and brighter every day.